Good afternoon. So uh, today we are going to continue with the nervous system and we are going to deal with the sensory part of the nervous system. Remember that we mentioned previously the functions of the nervous system are sensation and then integration and then motor activity. So the, uh, today we are going to deal with the sensory part of the functions of the nervous system. And a sensation is a conscious, could be conscious or subconscious, as you will notice that today as well, uh, awareness of changes, whether in the external environment or internal environment inside the body. And uh, these sensations could be either general, which we are concerned with today, or they are special senses. And we have two lectures that will be dedicated to the special senses. So the special senses, they include like taste, olfaction, vision, uh, hearing, and equilibrium. We will have two lectures, the lecture on Friday and the lecture, one of the lectures on next week. And today's lecture will be mainly dedicated to the general sensations. So these general sensations could be somatic sensations or visceral sensation. Visceral sensation mean they give information about the internal environment, about the viscera inside the body. And the uh, somatic sensation uh, means that they are related to the body, to the outside of the body. So they include either tactile sensation, like touch, pressure, vibration, itch, tickling, or they include thermal, cold and temperature, or they include pain. We will deal with that a lot today. Uh, nociceptors, we call them, the sensory receptors that are related to pain. Or we uh, include proprioception, and possibly we have mentioned about proprioception now several times. It's the sense of position and the sense of movement, proprioception. And remember that in both cases, um, like for example, in proprioception, there is conscious and there is subconscious proprioception. Um, again, I will come to this point when I deal with the, uh, probably the last slide of this, of this lecture. The visceral sensation, as I said, information about condition of the internal organs, like uh, chemicals, stretch, pressure, hunger, and temperature. So the receptors, we have receptors in the body. We can classify them according to the location of the receptor, whether they are present on the surface of the body or deep in the body, the type of the stimulus, whether it is pain, temperature, pressure, and the structural classification of the receptor, whether it's just like free nerve ending, simple, or it is encapsulated, or there is some cell, specialized cell involved in it. We will deal with that uh, in uh, the following slide. So first, the classification of receptor, is according to the location of the receptor. According to the location, we have exterior receptors, which are close to the surface of the body. And you will find that there are a lot of them are present in the skin. We have studied the integumentary system, but we have deferred the study of the, these receptors in the skin to the nervous system. So there many of them are present in the, in the skin. So today you need to refresh your memory about the skin as well. Uh, they receive external stimuli, these exterior receptors, like touch, as I said, uh, pressure, pain, vibration, and uh, also exterior receptors include vision and smell and taste. But the other receptors for touch, pressure, pain, vibration, and temperature, they are all present in the skin. And then we have the interior receptors, which are present in the blood vessels and the viscera, all the viscera of the body, they have anterior receptors and they can feel pain, for example, or other sensations that do not reach our conscious level. Probably we mentioned that before, that the, there are sensory stimuli that take place in the, uh, or reflexes that take place in the GI tract, for example, and we are unconscious of that. This constitutes what we call the enteric part, enteric nervous system. But pain, we are aware of that, as well as pressure. When there is, for example, pain arising from a peptic ulcer in the stomach or in the duodenum, or when there is distension, for example, of the large intestine um, or spasm of the muscles, of the smooth muscles 
of the small intestine, uh, we will feel that um, in, consciously. The other type of receptors, according to location, are the proprioceptors, the one that feel the position and the movement. And these are present in muscles, in tendons, in ligaments. Uh, they are present in the capsules of the joint, wherever the movement uh, takes place. We haven't studied these receptors when we studied the muscles. So now we are coming back and uh, studying them as part of the nervous system. According to the stimuli detected, the second classification, we have the, I think most of the names are obvious, mechanoceptors, like they feel mechanical stimuli, like touch and pressure. One point about touch I would like to mention, uh, touch, um, is sometimes it's uh, considered, uh, you call, they call it crude touch, and sometimes they call it discriminative touch. And these two types of touch sensation have different pathways to the brain. By crude touch is that when you are touched by something, but you cannot exactly mention where this touch was. But in discriminative touch, this is the precise touch, is that you can precisely say where that stimulus started on the surface of your, of your body. Then we have the thermoreceptors, obviously, change in temperature, photo for vision, uh, osmoreceptors, they sense the amount of body fluids, and chemoreceptors, they sense the chemicals. So now two types of classification of receptors, location, exterior, interior, and proprioceptors, type of the stimuli detected as, as I said, like mechanoreceptors receptors or thermoreceptors, and then structural classification. Now this is uh, interesting here that there are free nerve endings or encapsulated or separate sensory cells. Free nerve endings means that the sensory part of the neuron is the dendrite, so they are dendrites, they are just located free. There is no modification in the dendrite. And these free nerve endings, they are present everywhere in the body, except in the brain, and they feel the pain, temperature, tickle, itch, and touch. The encapsulated nerve endings are the dendrite. Again, they should be dendrites, but they are encapsulated. They are surrounded by a connective tissue capsule, and they have different shapes, as you will see in a, in, in a moment. And then we have separate sensory cells, and these we will find them when we study, the, for example, the ear. Uh, there are hair cells that sense the movement, uh, or there are uh, rods and cones, as the example showing here, the rods in the retina of the eye. So uh, these will stimulate the sensory nerve endings. So there are specialized cells that stimulate the nerve endings. This is structurally speaking. So they are either free, or they are encapsulated with different shapes, or there are certain sensory uh, cells, um, like the hair cells, as I said, present in the internal ear. We will find that they are also present in the, for equilibrium in the utricle, the saccule, and the semicircular canals, and the photoreceptors for uh, the retina. Now let's deal with the free nerve endings. Obviously, these are free nerve endings. These free nerve endings that you see them here are present in the epithelium, in the epidermis. Free nerve endings present in the epidermis. We said that the epidermis, the, the um, epithelium, is sensitive, but it has no blood supply, but it is sensitive. So these are the free nerve endings. They can feel the itch, tickle, um, temperature uh, sensations. But there are also other free nerve endings which are present here and constitute the hair root plexus. Probably we mentioned about the hair root plexus. It surrounds the hair follicle. And what is the hair follicle? The hair follicle is nothing but an invagination of the epidermis into the dermis and surround the hair. So again, they are surrounded by the hair root plexus. We mentioned previously that because of the presence of the hair root plexus, then plugging the hair will be painful. But for example, cutting the hair on the surface of the body is painless because here the hair doesn't have any uh, sensory nerve endings. So these are useful. They can, any movement in the hair can be detected. So they can detect, for example, if there is uh, like um, a, an insect walking or uh, crawling on the surface uh, of your skin, 
they can be detected by these uh, hair root plaques. They are just free nerve endings. So there are free nerve endings which are present in the epidermis and there are free nerve endings surrounding the hair follicle. And again, there is the Merkel, Merkel's disc which is uh, formed of, it's a flattened nerve ending, flattened dendrite, and is uh, connected or related to Merkel cells. Remember these cells? The Merkel cells, one of the cell types that are present in the epidermis, and they are present in the stratum basale. So because they are so to, to be closely related to the sensory nerve ending. So these are the uh, Merkel's disc, we call them. They are located in the sensory parts of the body, like the fingertips and the palm, in the external genitalia and the lips. And they um, are receptors of uh, fine touch and pressure. Fine touch means like discriminative touch, not the crude touch. So they can clearly discriminate between the uh, where is the touch taking place and pressure. And this is a new term here is that they are slowly adapting. So some of the receptors are rapidly adapting, like immediately they will stop sending impulses. They can sense the impulse at the beginning and then they adapt themselves to that stimulus and they will stop sending impulses. Like for example, rapidly adapting are the receptors, um, uh, for example, the um, um, that sense the temperature. Like when you you go into the into the shower for the first time, um, you will feel that it's so so hot. But like within a couple of seconds, you will feel that it's warm and nice, and then you continue because the receptors are adapting. When you put on on your uh, shirt, then you will feel the shirt for a couple of seconds, and then you will not feel it. Uh, anymore. These are slowly adapting. They will continue feeling. Like when you hold something in your hand, you will continue feeling uh, the, the feeling that there is something in your hand. So they are not rapidly adapting. They are slowly adapting. The other type of receptors that we have in the skin are the Meissner's corpuscles, and these are not free. They are not. They are from the structural point of view. They are encapsulated nerve endings. So there are, uh, here we have, you can see the dendrites. There are multiple dendrites here, but they are encapsulated by an oval capsule of connective tissue surrounding them. And they have very characteristic location. Remember these called the uh, papillae of papillary layer of the dermis. I just want to remind you that the skin consists of the epidermis here and then the dermis, and the dermis consists of the papillary layer. These are the finger-like projections that increase the surface area of contact between dermis and epidermis. So they are very deep and thick skin. And then the other part is called the reticular layer. The deeper part of the dermis is called the reticular layer. In fact, this is the dermis from here to here. And then we have the hypodermis or the subcutaneous tissue. So this is the papillary layer and this is the reticular layer of the dermis. These corpuscles are present in the reticular in the papillary layer of the uh, of the dermis. And some textbooks they describe them like a, a skin of wool. And they are receptors for fine touch, the discriminative touch. Again, they are rapidly uh, uh, adapting, uh, rapidly adapting receptors, not like the, um, uh, the Merkel, Merkel disc, which is slowly adapting. Then the other type of receptors which are encapsulated are called Ruffini. They are a little bit flattened and they are located a little bit deep in the dermis, not in the superficial part of the dermis, unlike the uh, unlike the masonal corpuscle, they are present deep in the dermis. Not very deep, but they are deep in the dermis, and they uh, detect stretch and pressure. They are the receptors that are most active during your, uh, a massage session. There is pressure, and there is a stretching of the skin, and they are present deep in the dermis. And then finally, the last one is this, which is called the Pacinian corpuscle. It looks like a cut onion, so it has multiple lamellae, we call them, 
lamellae or layers of connective tissue, and they are all surrounding a dendrite, a terminal single nerve inside. Okay, so multiple lamellae looks like a cut onion, and they are present in the deeper part of the dermis or even in the hypodermis, but they are deeper layer. So the most superficial in the dermis, we have the uh, Meissner corpuscle, and then we have the Ruffini corpuscles. Uh, Meissner are for touch. The Ruffini, again, I mentioned for they are for pressure and stretch, while the uh, these corpuscles they are for vibration. So they feel vibration. Uh, the ones that are present in the skin, they are for vibration, sense of vibration. A point to be mentioned here about pain sensation. In fact. It is always said that pain is a noble symptom because it tells you and it tells the body that there's something wrong and you have to do something about it. The receptors for pain are called nociceptors, as we mentioned, and structurally speaking, they are present everywhere in the body except in the brain, and they are free nerve endings. They are free nerve endings. How does this stimulus of pain start? It starts when there is like intense thermal stimuli or intense mechanical stimuli like something pinching or chemical stimuli as well this is on the surface of the skin inside the body pain can result from over distension of like of a viscous over distension of the bladder and if you don't urinate you'll start feeling pain uh, or over distension of the intestine and you'll start feeling pain this is called visceral pain. Muscle spasm as well produces pain, whether smooth muscle or skeletal muscle spasm, and inadequate blood flow, because inadequate blood flow will result in accumulation of metabolites inside the viscous. So for example, like ischemia, if there is inadequate blood flow to the heart, this will cause uh, angina or myocardial infarction, uh, because of the reduced blood flow, not necessarily for the heart, but ischemia might sometimes take place in a piece of intestine. And again, the patient will present as an acute condition, a very severe acute, acute pain. When the appendix, for example, is inflamed, it was blocked and distended. This is not ischemia, but it might later on lead to, ische lead to ischemia. But I'm talking about distension as uh, in, in, in this situation. And of course, in this case, uh, there, there is a, some kind of tissue injury, like few cells or multiple cells might be injured depending on the severity of the uh, stimulus. And therefore, this will result in release of chemical substances that will trigger the sensation of pain in the free nerve endings in the nociceptors. So like potassium ions, kinines, prostaglandins, they stimulate these nociceptors. And you find that the pain might persist for a long period of time because although the stimulus is removed, but these chemicals are still lingering there and will continue causing the pain. In some places, in some cases, the pain is said to be referred. So for example, uh, pain arising from a deep structure, a deep viscous, might be felt on the surface of the body. Um, the problem is that the, it needs differential diagnosis is that sometimes visceral pain is felt somewhere else in the body. This is what we call referred pain. So the patient will feel as if the pain is arising from somewhere else in the body. A very good example in this situation is the example of ischemic pain of the heart, angina or myocardial infarction. Okay, there is reduction in the blood supply of the heart. So the muscle of the heart, which is always pumping, always requires oxygen, no more receives the um, uh, required amount of oxygen. And this might cause accumulation of metabolites inside the muscle, or this might take longer time and there will be death of cardiac muscle, which is called infarction. If it is just a transient, it is called angina. If it is uh, it is no it is permanent 
death of muscle tissue and of course you know that the muscle is not going to be is not going to be replaced by muscle fibers this is cardiac muscle not smooth muscle so it's going to be replaced by fibrous tissue this is called is myocardial infarction so the pain arising from the heart will be felt on the surface of the chest as well as on the medial side of the arm this is the very typical characteristic pain arising from the heart surface of the chest on the left side and the medial side of the arm and the reason for that is that these areas of skin the dermatomes remember the dermatomes these areas of skin they receive sensation from certain parts uh, 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 certain segments of the spinal cord these are t1 to t4 spinal cord segments these same areas you can see here the skin it receives a, a relay sensory fibers to T, T1 to T4 spinal cord segments. And the same thing is the heart. The heart also relays sensory information to the same area of this or to the same segments of the spinal cord. So the brain will perceive the sensations as if arising from the skin. Okay? It's a false impression because the, these two regions the skin the pain is not arising from the skin but any pain arising from the skin will relay in these spinal cord segments so when there is visceral pain arising from the heart in this situation it will be felt as if it is arising from the skin that's what we call referred visceral pain actually it is not arising from the skin but it is perceived by the brain as if arising from the skin. There are many other examples of such referred visceral referred pain in the in the body. This is the best example of visceral referred pain. To relieve the pain, so either we use anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin and ibuprofen, which is better known as Advil. So uh, these will reduce the chemicals, uh, reduce the amount, especially the prostaglandins, reduce the uh, form block the formation of prostaglandins and as I mentioned that prostaglandins are released in case of tissue injury and they stimulate the nociceptors so by this way they act peripherally and also there are local anesthetics for example when you go to the dentist you will have a, a nerve block and this nerve block these local anesthetics like for example Novocaine will block the transmission along the nerve but this will take a, a short period of time that's why in, in some some cases you are advised by the dentist to have ibuprofen for a day or so in order to uh, block the pain um, but this is in another by another way by blocking the prostaglandins not by blocking the nerve impulses the nerve impulses can be only can only be blocked by using local anesthetics and in very severe cases of pain especially after major operations usually they use morphine for example and this acts centrally on the brain and reduce the perception of pain by the way our perception of pain varies from individual to individual and it varies depending on the surrounding conditions yeah, for example you will feel that you have more pain at night than you have pain in the morning sometimes if you are involved in like for example a soldier in the battle in the battlefield at the time of the operations for example he might be hit but he will not notice that until like a, um, an hour later uh, because there are certain uh, neurotransmitters especially here in the spinal cord I'm not going to go into details of these, but there are neurotransmitters here that block this or even reduce the sensation of pain. So um, these are called endorphins, and they can uh, naturally they can block the sensation of pain. It is thought that uh, acupuncture might work by stimulating the release of these pain blockers, the natural pain blockers the proprioceptive sensation is the as i said the awareness of the body position and movement like when you walk when you type with 10 fingers and sometimes you use it to estimate the weight 
of so that in order to have an idea about how much muscle contraction you are required. The proprioceptors do not adapt easily. They only adapt slightly. And uh, they are present in different parts of the body. This is an, the best place where they are present. They are present in what we call muscle spindle. So within the muscle, there are what we call intrafusal muscle fibers. They are modified muscle fibers. We didn't study them before. They are present here and there in the muscle, modified and encapsulated. So this receptor is encapsulated. Um, essentially, it is muscle fibers modified, surrounded by connective tissue. And um, it, as you can see, it, it has a motor and sensory fiber. So the, the, the motor fiber will cause these muscle fibers to contract according to the uh, tone of the muscle. And the sensory will sense the amount of stretch in the muscle. So if the muscle is stretched too much, then these sensory fibers will produce a reflex causing contraction of the extrafusal muscle fibers. These are the extrafusal, the muscle fibers which we have studied, the muscles that can contract and produce movement. So if there, is, if the, if, if there are sensory impulses, this is a proprioceptor. Proprioceptive sensation will go to the central nervous system represented by the spinal cord and where integration takes place and this will result in reflex contraction of the muscle. This is what happens in the uh, uh, reflexes, the tendon reflexes. One of them was mentioned before, which is called the ankle jerk. When you tap on the ligamentum patelli, this tapping on the ligament will be interpreted by the intrafusal muscle fibers by the muscle spindle as a muscle stretch. And reflexly, the, there will be a contraction of the muscle. The other proprioceptors are located in the tendon itself, in the tendon of the muscle. And it's called Golgi tendon organ. And, and this one is that when the muscle is excessively contracting to a degree that it might injure the muscle, then this will sense this excessive contraction in the muscle and result in relaxation of the muscle. So it inhibits. So the uh, Golgi tendon, it causes muscle relaxation when it is stimulated by excessive contraction of muscle, while the muscle spindle will cause contraction of the uh, muscle when the muscle is excessively stretched. Of course, they are continuously working these um, um, in order to uh, adjust the muscle tone and, uh, and posture as well. It's not only when you hit uh, on the tendon that you will feel the, that you will uh, elicit the jerk. Then we have similar receptors um, in, in the joints, um, either free nerve endings or Ruffini corpuscles, they are present in the capsule of the joint, or uh, some of them are present in the ligaments inside the joint, like Golgi tendon organ. The pacinian corpuscles, which are present in the connective tissue outside the joint, they, are, they respond to acceleration and deceleration, unlike the, the ones that were present in the skin. Remember that pacinian corpuscle present in the dermis? They are for vibration there, but here they have another function. They, are, um, they respond to acceleration and deceleration. They, are, um, they have a different function. Okay, so far about the receptors. Now, uh, we need to concentrate a little bit on these two topics. So I just want to remind you of probably the second lecture in this, in this block that we have a spinal cord with a dorsal horn of gray matter, a ventral horn, a central canal, and again, dorsal and ventral horns. And then we have here a spinal nerve. This is the dorsal root of the spinal nerve. It contains a dorsal root ganglion, 
containing sensory cells of the pseudo-unipolar neurons, okay? And let's consider that we are here, we are feeling pain. So that will be the skin here, okay? On the surface of the skin. The nerve, in order to, co to, con to complete the story, the nerve has, there are neurons here, these are motor neurons, and this is the ventral root of the spinal nerve, which will form the nerve, okay? And this will, for example, it will affect the muscle, okay? But we are not concerned with the motor component of the nerve. But just to remind you that the nerve, the spinal nerve, consists of a dorsal root, a ventral root. The dorsal root has a dorsal root ganglion. And these are uh, the uh, central processes of these pseudo-unipolar neurons, they go to the posterior or dorsal horn of the spinal cord. So in the pain pathway, in this sensory pathway, which is the pain pathway, we have three neurons involved. This is the first neuron. We call it first order neuron. The second neuron, the second neuron is located here in the posterior horn of the spinal cord. This is gray matter here. It's a gray matter. So you expect that it's full with nerve cell bodies. The axon of this second order neuron will cross the midline. It will cross the midline and ascend in the white matter because this is an axon. It's no more a cell body. So this is the white matter. This is what we call the lateral funiculus. Okay, and this will be the second order neuron. Okay, and this axon goes up and reaches the thalamus. Remember the thalamus here? The thalamus is the hub of all sensory impulses in the body. And so in the thalamus, we have the third order neuron. And the third order neuron will project to the cortex, cerebral cortex. Okay, this is what we call the third order neuron. Which part of the cortex, if, I'm, if I draw the cerebrum like this, and this is the central sulcus, so where do you think that this cortex that receives pain sensation from the skin, whether of the skin of the toe or the skin of the finger, where is that cortex located? Post-central gyrus in the parietal lobe. This is the primary somatosensory area. Go back to the third lecture of this block, okay? You will find that there is functional localization in the cerebral cortex. There's a visual area here, auditory area here, there's the speech area here, and there is the what we call the uh, somesthetic area or primary uh, somesthetic area and the post-central gyrus. The pre-central gyrus is motor. So you can see that here, this type of sensation, which is pain, I can add to it temperature, okay, crude touch and the pressure, all these modalities of pain, they have the same pathway. So a pathway, and we have here, there is a tract. This is what we call the lateral spino, because it's from the spinal cord, thalamic tract and going to the thalamus. This is the thalamus, okay? So a tract, again, this definition was mentioned before in the first lecture <clears throat> or the second lecture, that it's a bunch of axons that have a, a certain function, they have a common origin and a common destination. It is like a nerve, but inside the central nervous system. So there are three neurons in to com continue the pathway. The first order neuron is located in the dorsal root ganglion. The second order neuron is located either in the spinal cord, in this case, where it is involving pain, crude touch, temperature, and pressure. And the third is always present in the thalamus. And the cortex that is involved in this case is the post-central gyrus. In, in which lobe of the brain? In the parietal lobe. 
new slides. Again, we have a spinal cord with dorsal horn, ventral horn, central canal, ventral and dorsal. And we have, I'm not going to use colors. So uh, we have, again, we have a dorsal root ganglion, and this is carrying sensation, let's say, from a muscle spindle. And then the central will go into the spinal cord, but it will not terminate in the spinal cord. It will ascend up in the posterior column or posterior funiculus of the spinal cord. In the posterior column or post posterior funiculus, we have what we call a fasciculus gracilis and a fasciculus cuneatus. That was mentioned in the second and, and third lecture. And then it reaches the medulla oblongata. Here's the medulla. That's the pyramid. And in the posterior part of the medulla, we have nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus. So it will end up here at in the nucleus cuneatus or in the nucleus gracilis if it is from the lower limb. So this is the first order neuron. It's the same, again, in dorsal root ganglion. If you go back here, this is the first order neuron. But the difference is that the second order neuron is located in the medulla oblongata, not in the spinal cord, okay? That's the second order neuron. The second order neuron in this pathway, pain, touch, temperature pathway, is in the dors dorsal horn of the spinal cords. What happened to the second order neuron? What happened to it here? Decussates, cross to the other side. So the crossing here, Again, the second order neuron should cross. Although it is present in the medulla, it should cross. As I, we mentioned before, crossing takes place for motor and sensory fibers. And by this way, one side of the brain controls or receives sensation from the other side of the body. But there is no one specific site for crossing. But ultimately, they will cross. So the crossing in this pathway takes place in the, in the medulla oblongata, and the crossing fibers here, they constitute what we call the medial lamniscus. And where's the third order neuron? I'll show it to you here. Where's the third order neuron? In the thalamus. So again, I'm, I'm drawing the thalamus, and the second order neuron ends here. Third order neuron starts in the thalamus, and reaches the cortex, the same cortex, same cortex, the parietal lobe, okay? So you can see here that not all the sensations have the same pathway. These sensations that arise from muscle spindle, for example, the sense of vibration, sense of conscious proprioception, I know where is my hand now, where, where the condition of my elbow joint, Okay, and the discriminative touch, not the crude touch. Okay, all these sensations, they are in, in this pathway, in the other pathway. The first pathway is for pain, temperature, and crude touch and pressure. Okay, the, the, the common things between these pathways is that there are three neurons involved, first, second, third order neuron. There is crossing, okay? The crossing takes place either in the spinal cord or in the medulla. The second order neuron is either located, therefore, in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord or in the medulla oblongata. The, th the third order neuron is always present in the thalamus, and the thalamus projects to the post-central gyrus of the parietal lobe. So the first pathway for pain and temperature is called the spinothalamic pathway because it is um, the second order neurons are coming from the spinal cord to the thalamus and then from the thalamus you can see the third order neurons are located here and they project into the primary som somatosensory area. The second one we call it posterior column medial lamniscus pathway because the fibers, they are not located in the lateral column, they are not here, they are located in the posterior column. And these are fibers of first order neurons, 
and they cross in the medulla to form the medial lemniscus, medulla oblongata, to form the medial lemniscus. So that's why it's called posterior column medial lemniscus pathway. But always the first cell body, first order neuron, is located in the dorsal root ganglion. In the case of the face, it is almost the same situation, but here we don't have a spinal nerve. It is the trigeminal nerve that carries these sensations from the skin of the face. I'm not going to go into details now. The area in the cerebral cortex, and this is very important, I'm going to also deal with it when I deal with the motor functions. You can see here that in the, the, this post-central gyrus, the area of the cerebral cortex that is responsible for a certain part, for, to serve a certain part of the body, is not proportionate to the size of this part of the body. So it is not, for example, proportionate to the size of the tip of the finger. You can imagine how many receptors are located in the tip of my finger or in the, in the hand. So that's why, if you look at it here, you will find that the area that serves the hand is much bigger than, for example, the area that serves the entire lower limb. So the area here is proportionate to the, to the sensory importance of that part. Look at the lip. It's a very big area for the lip because of the, uh, a lot of sensations come from the lip, a lot of sensations coming from the, from the face. And usually the body is represented as inverted, face down, trunk up, and the lower limbs are up. This is what we call, and if you draw the body in this, in this way, to represent it in the areas of cerebral cortex, it looks like, like a midget, or uh, they call it homunculus. So this is what we call a sensory homunculus. It is inverted, and again, it is serving the contralateral side of the body. The last slide here is about the pathways to the cerebellum that sense the unconscious proprioception. Probably, as again, I mentioned that before, the conscious proprioception is served through the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway and ends in the cerebral cortex. That's why we are aware of it. But the unconscious proprioception, as now I'm addressing you, I'm not falling down because there are, mecha there are pathways between these same proprioceptors and the cerebellum. Okay, and these pathways to the cerebellum, um, they will help control the tone of my muscles and uh, prevent me from falling down. So these pathways are called spinocerebellar tract. Spino, from the spinal cord to the cerebellum. Spinocerebellar tract, we have posterior and anterior spinocerebellar tract. The unusual thing about it here is that these pathways or the, the cerebellum, each lobe of the cerebellum controls the same side of the body, not contralateral side of the body. I don't know why, but this is uh, how it happens. Sometimes there is no crossing, sometimes there is fibers, they cross twice. But the theme is that the cerebellum controls the same side of the body.